God of growth, help us to listen to your word, to understand your ways and to trust in your promises. Good morning to you all, brothers and sisters. We do welcome you here on our social media platform, and we hope you are going to enjoy the message coming from the word of God. May God bless you as you continue to listen to the word of God. Amen. Let us pray. God of surprises, help us to find you in the hidden and in the unexpected. May we see you in the small actions that make a difference and discern your love at work when your presence is hidden. Help us to know your life-giving power so that we might flourish and bear fruit in our own lives and communities. Father, we just want to thank you as we are here, Father, Creator God, Lord Spirit, standing before you, grounded on the earth, our hands straight out to you, Father. Just say thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord, for giving us this opportunity to worship you, to praise you, to honor you. In your name I pray. Amen. I'll call my brother Ben to come and read the Bible from the book of uh, Mark chapter 4, verses uh, 26 to 34. Okay. Thank jo thanks, Johnson, and what a privilege it is to be here and reading the Word of God to you. And I just uh, encourage you throughout the week just to remember this verse and just to reflect on it and obviously reflect on what Johnson is going to share with us afterwards. Uh, as he said, Mark 4, 26 to 34. He also said, This is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seeds on the ground. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself the soil produces grain, first the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As, so, as soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it, because the harvest has come. Again he said, What shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on the earth. Yet, when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants, with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. With many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them as much as they could understand. He did not say anything to them without using parable. But when he was alone with his own disciples, he explained everything. It's a pretty, uh, pretty cool verse. And yeah, we can ask God to do the same for us. We can read the word and ask him to explain it to us. And he uh, always answers with a yes. But anyway... We'll get Johnson back to share his message this week. I uh, can't wait to hear what, what he's got planned for us. It's always good. And I'm excited. Thank you, Johnson. Thank you, Brother Ben, for the reading of the Word of God. Um, I, I'm here, brothers and sisters, to share with you on the theme, the multiple results. The multiple results. The kingdom of God is described in many different ways in the Bible. In Mark chapter 4, the kingdom of God is described in terms of small seeds, quietly planted by a farmer. The seeds can grow to great size, like a mustard plant, which is in ancient Israel, become one of the largest bush of bushes. Small beginnings can have great endings. An old story tells of two men climbing a mountain. The one promised the other who is feeling down and depressed that it will be worth the effort. Looking forward to the amazing destination, the latter climbs with his friends as they talk and spend time together. When they reach the top of the mountain, the second man looks around wondering what all the fuss was about. The view is great, but nothing spectacular is waiting at the pinnacle. His friend then explains to him that the journey was not about the destination, but about the climb. Their time together, their bonding, their talking, and his healing. 
The famous quote, life is about journey, not a destination, has been attributed to a number of authors from Emerson to Sousa. But the seeds of this Afroism lie deep down with the scriptures. Or perhaps I should say, in the soil. For it is in the metaphor of the seed that we are introduced to this wisdom straight from the mouth of God, going all the way back to the Garden of Eden. So the garden is one of the most amazing, beautiful metaphors in scripture. Eden is our origin story, not just because of our creation, but our creation relation with God. So the scriptures are all about relationships. Those we must guard and nourish, and those we must create and cultivate. So the garden is the metaphor of us and our God relationship. And we are called both to till and keep it, and to bear fruit and multiply throughout cultures and generations. That is what you have been asked to do. So, this is the both a sacred and a practical imperative because not only is our relation with God the source of life, but practically speaking, unless we nurture our relation with God and then seed the covenant forward generation after generation among everyone we can, God will no longer have no people. God will no longer have a people. So, see what great love the Father has loved on us what we should be called children of God, and that is what we are in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Isn't that great? Because the world does not know God. That's why they cannot worship him. The growth of God's garden kingdom depends upon acts of tending and seeding. So in our context, we might call that ministry and mission or a more explicit discipleship and evangelism. Evangelism is the church's responsibility until Christ comes again. It is proclaiming the true gospel, the good news of and about Jesus Christ, nothing more, nothing less. So that's, that's the main thing that we have been called to do. So let me remind you of the story in Genesis chapter 11 of the story of Babylon. God again takes on the metaphor of sower and we, a metaphor of seed. Sometimes missed or read over in the telling of the Bible story. In response, our wailing ourselves off behind a stony enclosure with a watchtower within it. God breaks down our walls, gathers us up, and sows us back into the world, distributing us everywhere to gain, put down roots, and restore our job of covenant keepers, fruit bearers, seeders. For we only take this role seriously when we are dependent upon the sovereignty of God. In Genesis chapter 11, verse 4, 8, we hear, And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. Notice that they said, Let us build a city. Let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad. In my opinion, the sole purpose of this tower was for a rallying place for men. And because without us fulfilling this role, God will no longer have a people. Our job is not to reach a destination in which we have reached our independent goals, no longer need God, no longer have a sacred purpose or to pursue, where we find that the people of today or of the generation in today's world. They no longer need God. They don't need God. They have nothing to do with God. They no longer have even sacred people. There's nothing sacred in their life. So our job as God's people to, is to be in a perpetual and self-long process of nurturing, keeping and seeding and sowing the covenant of God, even as God continues to nurture and grow us as people. So the purpose is in the process, not in the destination. It is in the process of what we are doing. So in our scripture for today, Jesus re-explains what it means to be in covenant with God. To be a worker in God's vineyard. To be part of God's kingdom. Jesus gives us two clues. The kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground. And would sleep and rise night and day. And the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. 
So he also said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God or what parable will we use for it? It is like a master seed, which when sown upon the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on earth, yet when it's sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches that the bears of the air can make nest in its shade. I like to call this the pure gospel. For we have a simple job. We are both seeds and sowers. We plant ourselves in God's care. Seed our faith deeply in Jesus Christ. And we live our lives growing into that relationship. We till and keep the kingdom of God within us. Our relationship with God that nourishes us. We mature in our discipleship and grow in our faith. And then we organically and naturally bear the fruit that the relationship in our lives produce. After that, we save as sow as ourselves, sowing the seeds, the results of our discipleship and the proclamation of the covenant of God, of the gospel and planting them into the hearts, the minds of the people everywhere, including our own children and grandchildren, so that future generations and on people will also know the glory and the wonder of Jesus Christ. So wherever we are, we need to proclaim the gospel of the kingdom to our own children. Not only our own children, to our grandchildren and grand-grandchildren, if we are able to do that. And that is what God is calling us to do. This is how the kingdom grows. And it goes against everything as we people like to do as part of our agendas, strategies and visions. Jesus knew and we know too. That at heart, we are like the Bible kind of people who are described in Genesis chapter 11 want to make something for themselves. We love the destination. They wanted to go up there on their own, not through what God has asked. We worship the destination. We wanted to spend all of our time scheming how to get there. In doing so, we ignore the most important lesson that everything in life and in our relationship with God is about the walk. Not about the destination. It's about the walk with God. How do we walk with God on every day? Even in our faith, we too often set our sights upon heaven and what will happen after death. We are concentrating about what will happen when I die. But in doing so, we cannot forget that the most important job we have is what do we do on the way in our lives in our ministry, in our mission, in our relationship with God, in our proclamation of the gospel to others, to whom we can give the gift of life, nourishment, salvation, and hope. That is what we are supposed to be telling people. Because that is the most important thing. We cannot feed the world if we do not plant any fields. <laughs> Get that clear. We cannot feed the world if we do not plant any fields. In both of Jesus' parables today, Jesus emphasized that the kingdom of God, meaning those who worship God and follow Jesus, living in community together, grows by the consistent nurturing, scattering and seeding of the gospel. But how it grows, how fast, how much, where and when is, not far to us know. We should not even worry about it. It just happens. It just happens. So when we remain in the process of bothering nourishment, our own relationship with God, and seeding that love of God in others, it simply grows without us ever having to think about it. Even that we believe to be the smallest of efforts, or the smallest acts of faith and evangelism, may be planting unknown roots into new places, new hearts and new minds. So whenever you are walking, wherever you are, whenever you are moving around, when you meet someone, don't hide who you are. You are a messenger of God. Don't hide who you are. Don't hide your identity. You are a messenger of God who is supposed to proclaim the word of God. What starts out very small can become very big. What starts out weak can become strong. What starts out insignificant can become are hugely significant. What starts out unimportant can become very important. And when you see this happening, Jesus says, watch out because you just may be already living 
in the kingdom of God. Not very small things becomes big in the kingdom of God. Every small thing has the potential to become big in the kingdom of God. When you live in the kingdom, you don't dare dismiss anything or anyone regardless of their size, their background, where they come from. You don't dismiss them. No person is so weak that they cannot become strong in the kingdom of God. No act is so insignificant that it can, can become life-saving. No idea is so irrational that it can lead to solve a problem. So in the kingdom of God, there are no rejects. <laughs> they are all superstars. In the kingdom of God, there are no throwaway moments, no inconsequential conversations, no unimportant people. Every person who walks through the door is important. Everyone who walks through the door of the church, what is it that brought that person to the church on that very day? That person is very important. There is something Every word spoken is a witness. Every life touched is a gift of God. Do you see how it works? Everything you say to anyone you are witnessing, either you are a good witness or you are a bad one. It depends how you witness. Maybe the seed will grow, maybe it won't, but you plant it either by way, yay, who knows? Who knows what will happen? And besides, we are like farmers. Planting seed is what we do. Just like the farmers, what they do. I like the farmers. Day in, day out, they're in the field. They don't stop. Because they know that that is what they've been called to do. To provide food. It's the same with us. We should not even stop. Our evangelism is meant to grow others. Hearts in faith, so that they too may experience the wonder and glory of God in their lives. They too may know that they may because when you approach someone, you are saying you are very important. You matter. That's why I'm talking to you. This is not a selfish, but a selfless and sacrificial motivation. The joy is not in the destination. The joy comes through the walk. Through the walk. Was the con how was the conversation? How was it when you were talking to the person? Through the walk. So through all the scriptures, we learn that to live a life of faith commitment to God and loving self, world, and others to walk with God through God's garden life. We are just walking with God on every day. Do you walk with God? To walk with God means to live closely in tune with God, to be in step with God, to strive to come closer and closer to God in your life. You are walking with God. To allow God to fill us and it, Use us as natures and seeders of God's vineyard, God's kingdom. To walk with God is the ultimate compliment as one living a life in faith and love. So you are walking with God on a daily basis. From the book of Colossians 2, verse 6 to 7, it says, Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so we walk in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, just as you were taught abounding in thanksgiving. Notice that the scriptures don't say reaching God, attaining grace, achieving recognition, growing the church. No! The scriptures don't say that. Even Paul never speaks about growing the church. He only speaks about spreading the good news and loving each other. So the growth of the kingdom, the growth of the church happens organically when disciples and apostles take their role as natures. Fruit bearers, spreaders, seeders, seriously. <laughs> when we take that role, you find people coming. Why do people come? Because they are seeing what you are doing. They are seeing what you are doing. It is not for us to worry about, fret about strategies, but to attain through our various our own means. But God is God of the resurrections. And God raises up churches who are taking their role as fruit bearers and cedars to the heart. The moment you take Christ out, the moment you see things start happening in your church, you can see it. It will start happening. So we as the church, as called by Jesus Christ today, to re-examine our faith and our mission. What is our mission? What is our faith? Perhaps the best way then that we have to challenge ourselves is our churches is to say, 
show me your seeds. <laughs> if you are a farmer, show me your seeds. Where are you going to plant your seeds? Show me your seeds. Show me the fields where you are sowing the seeds. Show me your love. Show me your hearts. Show me your faith. Show me your walk. Show me. You can leave the rest to God. Show me. Show me. Show me your faith. Show me your seeds. You, you cannot plant without seeds. Or perhaps more simply, when I look at you, will I see Jesus reflected in your eyes? Will I see Christ reflected in your life? Pure faith and soiled by pesticides and natural growth techniques, artificial hormones, alien strategies will grow the most nature, mature, ripe and beautiful fruit, filled with seeds ready to take root. And we need to do, what we need to do is to plant them into the hearts and minds of others. So we continue to plant them in the hearts and minds of our friends, whoever we meet. My own farming skills taught me that planting seeds means that we recognize that what we can do and what we cannot do. There are certain things that we do when we are planting seeds. We do not produce the growth. Only God can do that. Whether we live in the first century in Israel or whether we live in the 21st century in Australia, God alone produces growth. That never changes. Night and day, whether the farmer sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he doesn't know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain. First the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. Mark 24, verse 27 and 28. That's what it says. So it is our job to scatter the seeds of faith. See to it that the plants get water and sun. Tend to the weeds that grow, which try to choke out the growing plants. That's what nature is all about. We need to nurture the plants. St. Paul puts it this way. I planted the seed. Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. Amen. So neither the one who plants nor the one who orders is anything, but only God who gives the growth. So the man who plants and the man who orders have one purpose, and each will be rewarded according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 6 to 9. Isn't that great? When it comes to being God's fellow workers, the first thing to realize is that we are not in control of the growth. We are called to plant. God gives the growth. God gets the credit. We cannot boast about the success that comes when the seeds are planted. We must be very cautious about talking taking credit too much to ourselves for apparent success in the spiritual area. When we see people coming to church, we feel we are doing great. We, I'm the one who's doing it. It's not you. It's God. Because he's the one who does the growth. Not you. God alone gives the growth, but we have an important role as God's fellow workers to plant nature and weed the field. This text is about our response as farmers in partnership with God. When this partnership works well, the growth of the word of God may be slow, but it can be highly productive. You may not see it. One of the places where we see this growth of the world is in the Christian family. We can see it in the Christian family. Hundreds of good Christian parents have told me that they are very concerned about their adult children who have stopped attending church and no longer practice the faith they learned in their homes. While this is great concern, there really isn't much we can do to keep our children in the faith once they are grown up. We can't do anything. We can plant the seeds and nurture them. We can weed the garden of faith when children are little. But we cannot guarantee that children will practice the faith when they grow up. Parents of small children have their work cut out of them today with so many pressures on families. There are a lot of things that we can do. But I want to let you know, it's high time you should consider planting the seeds in your own children. Pla teach them while they are young. Keep families together, nurturing the children in faith, teaching the truth of Christ in the home as well as in the church. We are these are essential times in which we live. The immorality in the world is frightening. It's really frightening. Our kids know a lot of things we have never known at a very early age. The poor children in our schools who are drinking, drugs, and immoral behavior is staggering. That's why the Christian home is so important. 
With, with pulling positive influences, the Christian family cannot be overemphasized. As parents plant the seed of faith in their children, great growth is, is a possibility. So the mother is a nurturing role in this growth. So does the father. One of the major problems in the modern home is the absence of a nurturing father. The immorality out at the schools and the world is frightening. The absence of many fathers in today's home is alarming. So if you are worried about crime, there is something we can do about it. We can bring biblical ideals for, of marriage and family to our neighborhoods, our own high schools. Where we find now that most of the schools now they are chucking out Christianity out of it. And what are the schools producing? Nature in Christian witnesses and parents can and should scatter the small seeds of God's kingdom. Nature these seeds, pull the weeds as best as they can. In the house, your responsibility is to pull the weeds as best as you can. Great growth is possible. The kingdom of God means growth like a seed entering and being nurtured in good soil that it might mature. So Christian maturity takes place by Christian witness and parents in pointing to what Jesus did by suffering and dying on the cross. So we should never stop pointing to what Jesus did. When the seed blossoms to maturity, it can be a thing of beauty. Small beginnings can have great endings. I know of other people. The kingdom of God is like a master seed, he said. Which when sown upon the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs. The seed is becoming a bush. I thank God because my mom yelled me to be what I am. She sowed the seeds of faith through her prayers. And today I am where I am. Like the farmer, we sow seeds. When the weather's good, looks promising. We sow seeds. When the weather's bad, washes away the seeds. We sow more seeds. The farmer seeds are so soya beans, corn, wheat, and hay. Ours are love, peace, kindness, joy, hope, grace, and we sow them regardless of the weather. When the weather brings hate, we sow seeds. When the weather brings tragedy, we sow seeds. When the weather brings despair, we sow seeds. When the weather brings pain and misery, we sow seeds. So we sow seeds every day. God's kingdom is growing in its own way from seemingly small beginnings. We are not to lose hope when the kingdom tarries. The seeds have been scattered. Small as they may appear to, to be to us, the Lord of the harvest will bring them to flower. Something is happening. Something great is happening. Something great is happening. I, I, I always tell people, the church will never die. In fact, the church grows more when it is being, under, being persecuted. <laughs> That's when Christians stand up. So I'm saying, brothers and sisters, let us continue to sow the seeds, even in adversity. God is on our side. May God bless you all. Remember that he's the God of multiplication. When he does it, a lot of things happen. God bless you all. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let us, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We thank you for everything. God of mystery. You are the sower, the savior. We worship you and we ask you to give us eyes to notice where the seeds of your kingdom are growing. Courage to show them to others. Faith enough to help us nurture them. And heart that it lies in the harvest. Thank you, Father, for this wonderful opportunity that you have given us. As we continue to worship you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, it is always a good thing to remember to thank God. Wherever you are. Don't forget to thank God. After hearing this message, always think, what can I do? And the message is, you need to thank God. So at the end of the service, please, you can thank God through your offerings. Um, you can use the account which is there, the details are there. Or uh, 
whatever methods you think of, but I'm saying don't forget to thank God. Let us pray for the offering. Heavenly Father, we come with our offerings before you. Bless these offerings, Father, for they have been made for you. Thank you, Father, for everything that you have done. May you continue to bless us, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, for you are God, God of wonders, God of miracles, God of everything. Thank you, Lord, for the gifts that you have given us. Bless all these gifts which have been given by your children so that they can be used for the, your kingdom, Father. Bless every one of the, your people who have managed to remember and allow themselves to say, to appreciate you. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let us receive grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all from now and evermore. Amen. Wow, what a great message from Johnson. I uh, just encourage you to give the thumbs up on um, the YouTube there. Also subscribe and um, ding the bell as well. So every time a new message comes, you uh, get, get first preference and that'll also help more people get redirected to Johnson's message. So yeah, give it a go. Thumbs up. Amen. <laughs>